So I was on call in our respiratory ICU one evening in 2019 when I got a call from our emergency department. There was a young man, I'll call him Ben, who came in short of breath. His lungs were full of fluid and inflammation. He didn't have enough oxygen and could not breathe. He needed a breathing tube and a ventilator to keep him alive. Ben, like this young woman, was one of several hundred young people that came to our hospitals and ICUs that fall and summer of 2019. He had been fine until a few days before. He developed a little bit of nausea, some belly pain, then a fever, then a dry cough, until he became so short of breath he came to our hospital. Ben, like this one woman, were uh, part of a group that had a mysterious illness where we had no idea what was causing their disease. Ben had been healthy, he wasn't even a smoker, he did vape, um, he didn't think the vaping made his breathing any worse, so he had kept vaping up until he came to the hospital. As the week wore on, we did test after test and had a growing list of things that we knew this disease wasn't, but still were not clear on what was causing Ben's illness. Ben, like this young woman, had vaping-associated lung injury. And if you think back to 2019, vaping was being sold as this hip cool thing to young people with lots of cool flavors and this safe alternative to smoking to older people. And this was really the first time we recognized on a broad scale that vaping was dangerous. As Ben and others like him recovered, we wanted to know whether they went back to normal. We warned the public about the risks of vaping. We shared our treatment protocols with doctors and hospitals around the world. And we found out that people didn't go back to normal. So they reported things like cognitive impairment, things like difficulty thinking, remembering, or making decisions. They had problems breathing, shortness of breath with walking or climbing upstairs and some even reported problems with dressing or bathing. These were young people who had suffered a really serious, serious and uh, life-threatening complication from vaping. Were they able to quit, we asked. And most had tried, and most had been able to cut down, but only 38% were able to quit all vaping and smoking completely. Did they change their vaping behavior in other ways, we asked. Yes. They changed their dealer. Yes, dealer. They quit vaping and started smoking instead. They cut back on vaping, but were still vaping every day. Overall, they said, they were being smarter about it. Meanwhile, the rates of vaping among teenagers, kids in middle and high school continued to rise. I asked my kids, all in middle school at the time, whether they knew of any kids in their school who vaped, and they all said yes. But don't worry, Mom, Sam told me, if you're a seventh grader and you vape, you're not just going out and buying it. There's a friend or a brother or a cousin or someone getting it for you. And it dawned on me that vaping, like so many other problems, is not just a problem of personal responsibility or choice. It's a problem of a community and a network. A network that exposes children to vaping, an exposure so risky and addictive that even after people have had the most severe life-threatening consequence, they're largely unable to quit. And then it was March of 2020. The grocery store shelves were empty. Nobody had toilet paper. Kids were sent home from school. People were sent home from work. And boundaries between home and work life evaporated. Some of us were called to the bedside to take care of patients. And we came. 
We risked our own lives and the lives of our families to help others. And our community supported us. People sent us cards, kind words, food. We asked them to stay home, to socially distance, to wear masks. And they largely did. And for all that hard work and sacrifice, we had some great success. People that had been in our ICUs for months on the brink of death came home to their families and their communities. And by that December, when we were giving out the first COVID vaccines, there was real joy and relief in the air. We had shown up and taken care of people our community had supported us. Scientists had developed vaccines that were safe and effective at incredible speed. COVID was over, except it wasn't. And over the next several years, we learned again and again what had always been true that the health of every one of us depends on the health of all of us. That COVID is a disease not only of an individual, but also of a community. Early on, we saw a community of people that lived in nursing homes. But we saw another group, too. These were young people who were essential workers whose jobs could not be done remotely. Later on, we saw another group well after vaccines and masks were widely available and recommended. These were people that were unvaccinated in their 30s and 40s, dying of COVID while they denied its existence. Like this young woman, Ben recovered from his vaping-associated lung injury, and I saw him in clinic a few months later. He had been able to quit vaping initially, but with the social isolation and stress from the pandemic, he had started again. He got COVID and had to come back to the hospital, but he survived. And when I saw him, he had been able to quit vaping with the support of his girlfriend and his family. So where do we go from here? We need to rebuild. Oh, what did we learn? <laughs> Sorry. We learned that some days are paradise, and others, we just have to show up and hope we're good enough. We learned that everything is political, healthcare, science, and education. We learned that no man is an island, that resilience and health rest within an individual and a community. We learned that ventilators don't take care of people, people take care of people. And perhaps most importantly, we learned that social isolation may be worse than COVID. We saw older patients dying from the isolation meant to protect them. And we saw children, never a group at highest risk from COVID itself, fill our emergency departments and mental health crises. Where do we go from here? We rebuild community. We need to rebuild community in our social lives, in our work lives, and in our family lives. Gathering together, being present with each other, and joy are not frilly extras we get as a luxury. These are the things that make it worth doing everything else we do. And so I ask you today to think about where do you find and build community and where do you find joy? Thank you.